Good afternoon. My name is Stephanie Dawson. I am a member of the AP Council and co-chair of the PGA East Green Committee. On behalf of the PGA One Guild Women's Impact Network, the Anti-Racism and Bias Working Group, and the Education Committee, I'd like to welcome you to a discussion series on equity in our industry. In this six-part series, we will discuss how we can make meaningful change toward equity in our industry, from writing and development, to casting and crewing up, financing, marketing and distribution, and ultimately institutional change. You may have heard our colleagues say that it's too difficult or the norms are too ingrained to make change now, but I believe this is a seminal moment in our history and we have the power as individuals and as content creators to move the needle toward a just society. In that end, after each session, we will follow up a panel discussion with a PDF of actionable items to inform and equip us as professionals with purpose. In this first session, Writing with Equity in Mind, our panel will discuss how the storylines that we produce affect how audiences worldwide see themselves and how they see each other. We'll discuss how to create inclusive storytelling that is both meaningful and authentic and also profitable. Our moderator today is Anissa Douglas, the leader of the Anti-Racism and Bias Networking Group. Anissa has extensive experience as a uh, producer in scripted and unscripted content, and her credits include Gotham, The Dead Files, and the launch of Young Sheldon. I'm excited for what I know will be a lively and informative discussion. Without further ado, Anissa, please take it away. Hello, culture creators and influencers. Yes, that's exactly who all of you are, culture creators and influencers. There is a responsibility that comes with that. And as you know, we work in an industry that most people only dream of working in, and you made it. At this critical time in history, we have to own our responsibility in creating and influencing culture. We can be the change. I'm pleased to welcome you to our Writing with Equity in Mind discussion and panel. I'd like to introduce Rena Brannon, VP of Development, Universal Content Productions. Rena was an agent for seven years and then went on to serve as head of development at 3AD Media, which produced ABC's The Good Doctor. Denise Davis, COO of Color Creative and producer at Hooray Media, providing access and opportunities for diverse and emerging writers. Denise is the supervising producer of the critically acclaimed and Emmy nominated HBO comedy series Insecure and is a producer on Robin Deed's Emmy nominated A Black Lady Sketch Show. And Tanya Siracho, creator, showrunner, EP of Vita. Tanya Siracho is a playwright and television writer whose credits include How to Get Away with Murder, HBO's Looking, and Devious Maids. She is the creator, showrunner, and executive producer of the critically acclaimed series Vita on Stars. Okay, let's get started. For everyone, what is the impact of a lack of representation of race, uh, LGBTQ people, women, and differently abled men, uh, pardon me, differently abled people in media and entertainment? Well, I can say that culturally, culturally as a consumer of entertainment, um, there's something that happens, especially in, in my community, the Latinx community, it's erasure, you know, when we are kept away from, from the, the screens, then it, it becomes erasure. And, and, and it's something really, it's, a, it's like cultural genocide in a way, you know, especially when, when um, people of the dominant culture or when we are not helming our stories, we are sort of consuming this uh, like Monsanto version of us that we didn't create, you know, that we that we don't help. And it, it's something really um, dangerous about that culturally, because like you said earlier on, we are culture makers. I mean, it, that's that's uh, representation is not just, you know, um, it, 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 it has like an, uh, a rea reaction of alchemy when it comes to, to culture, you know, like um, it, it, it uh, creates allowance license when people consume consume themselves, um, you know, thriving or um, being complicated. So, like uh, when we're kept away from that narrative, it's it's really dangerous. Yeah, and, and I'd like to add that you know, the, to have a lack of representation um, in storytelling period uh, is very dangerous because you know stories change the world, right? And they also create empathy and relatability for people to connect 
and understand how uh, we are just inherently human at the end of the day, no matter what color we are, no matter what um, uh, what we are at the end of the day, right? And so by uh, blocking those stories from being told, you're you're doing a disservice to so many people who are struggling and finding ways to relate to other communities that they're just outsiders in, right? And I think it, it allows us to bridge the gap and really showcase other, um, you know, other sides of humanity, other sides of communities, other sides of cultures, and, and allow it to feel normalized in a way that I think historically just isn't the case, right? And there's a reason why internationally, you know, people look at the, the white blondes or the, or, or the white male superhero as like the, the, the norm for America. And, the, and, and it's because our stories have been blocked from that. And so, you know, I, I think it, across the board, it's just, it's, it's so imperative and it's so important. Um, and I think where the future is going now more than ever, um, you know, we, we have to reflect the real America <laughs> at the end of the day. So that's, that's my opinion. And I think in many ways, we are living the aftermath of what happens when you have a lack of representation and not just a lack of representation but perhaps a bad representation and what that does and so it creates this massive ripple effect that's almost impossible to pinpoint or to calculate but i think we can all sort of agree that we're here in this moment and having this conversation because we're recognizing that as content creators as people who are purveyors of, of pop culture and just culture in general that we have a power we have a responsibility and maybe we haven't wielded that properly great answers so with that said how does diversity in the writers room and also on the development team affect how stereotypical or negative portrayals of underrepresented um, underrepresented communities and media and entertainment are what is the impact I, I just in my practice uh, right now, I don't necessarily need diversity in my writer's room. I, I, I like, I want empowerment. Um, and historically, I, I, yeah, I'm very, I'm very a uh, tunnel vision, right? I keep talking about Latinx, Latinx, but you know, but um, I, I made all three seasons of, of the, of the show all Latinx. And then the last season, all Latina, all the directors, all Latina, um, you know, my uh, all Hispanic um, editors too, because like, it's like about empowering the storytellers, you know? Um, and in my case, I didn't want a diverse room. I wanted just us um, because we hadn't, you know, at least we hadn't done that. And I think there's like an authenticity and like um, there's something like when you, you know, as a writer, when I, um, I was a writer for hire, um, it, I came into it, the first hour in my writer's like room experience was, um, a, a compañero, como se dice compañero, uh, a peer said that um, I was the diversity hire. Like he informed me I was the diversity hire, you know, like the first hour of my TV life. And that like just set up like an otherness that just, I didn't shake the rest of that room, you know, when you have, especially in a show like, like be that, like when you have, don't have that otherness, especially cause like half of the room is queer, brown, you know, we're all brown. We're like all Latinx. It, it, um, it, it's like, a luxury that shouldn't be a luxury that that you know that um and it helps with the storytelling because it just makes it more authentic now i don't know how my other shows are going to go but like at least in that regard i i thought the experiment should have been not diversity you know mm -hmm. um even though there's diversity within latinidad yeah and, and i'd really get into like you know why you should be um, inclusive in the rooms period is that you know i think people tend to forget about the burden when you have one person like like tanya said the diversity hire or i know a writer who was the only woman of color in a room that had a um a black female lead on the show and just talking to her about her experiences of the, the literally knowing she was hired to write for this one character but also that she was alone in the room to write for this one character and had no one there to support her or to defend or to to help you know be a larger voice and to you know get in front of storylines or things she felt like were were um we're not being authentic to the show and when you have just the one or think about zero which happens um that's how 
excuse my French, just, but that's how the bullshit gets on the screen in the first place, right? In terms of what is uh, considered negative stereotypes, what is considered um, ways of, of, of negative reflection of, of who we are. And so when I think about it, just like the impact is at the very end of the day, you have checks and balances. You have someone there allowing you, uh, allowing a space so that they could speak up and feel included in creating authentic storylines, creating authentic characters, but also, you know, being in support of the narrative. It's not like they're there to make their own show, but they're there to actually, you know, uh, uh, give input in it and have a hand in that. And, and I just think to not have it, it's just being completely um, uh, non -bi like completely biased in a way that you are, refusing to see just uh, the, the blind ear to racism, right? The blind ear to, to thinking that like, you could do it yourself when you don't come from these communities or have anything relatable to, to speak on. So um, yeah, it's just, I hate to say it, but it, it should go without saying at the end of the day, right? But I say that with a grain of salt because it happens. And I think it hopefully moving forward um, tends to happen a lot less because I, I do think there's a real reckoning happening at this moment and people are looking around these rooms and looking at who they're hiring and realizing like they don't want to be the ones who are out the spotlight and who are getting called out for um, not opening up seats at the table. And to kind of throw back to something that Denise had said in, in the last round of questioning, you know, one of the issues and and why we need to have just more representation across the board in the stories themselves is because we're there's a clearly a need in our society to allow for entry points for people of different backgrounds to empathize with one another. And so how can, if, if we agree that there's a need for that to create opportunities for people to understand and not just understand, but again, to empathize with different experiences, how can we ever give proper portrayals when there isn't anyone representing a certain point of view? And, and when we then have someone come in at, as a, their first time in TV, as just to reference what Tanya was saying, first time in TV to be the diversity hire, which not only others her, but she's put into a position where now she's coming in with the weight of the world on her shoulders to not just represent her point of view, but to represent all people of color. And in, in addition to that, we need to, when we bring people who are from marginalized communities into a space where there is a majority that they are not a part of, set people up to succeed. And how are we setting people up to succeed when their first job, they're carrying the weight of the world on their shoulders and feel this burden of having to police storylines and various things um, because of the responsibility that we, we as people of color feel, instead of just allowing for her to get comfortable and understand and learn the process of TV writing. Uh, all good answers. Denise, you mentioned a reckoning. Do you think it's here to stay? Or is it performative? What are your thoughts? Okay, uh, I'll be honest. I've been a little bullish because um, here's the thing. I, I think there is a lot of conversation. There is a lot of, like I said, awareness more than before. I don't feel like I'm screaming on deaf ears now when I even say the D word around diversity, although it needs to go away anyways. Um, but there is something to be said about people actually coming to the table to have the conversation. However, I'm bullish because as we both know, change isn't going to happen by tomorrow. Change isn't going to happen by December. Um, it's going to happen over the next few years until we actually see um, the results of some of the, the conversations and the, and the things that people are impl implementing now um, to, to you know, reform our system. And so uh, I'd like to be optimistic and say, hopefully we will see uh, certain areas and probably not everything, right? But certain areas actually come uh, be more inclusive and grow and actually have a different way of how we operate in Hollywood but that time is not here yet and i think it's why now more than ever even this conversation and even you know the the, the heads of studios and everyone actually uh again not being afraid to um look around their their uh their exec rooms look at their rooms uh the having the showrunners look at the writers rooms um looking at below the line and really looking at all of the the holes and the gaps that have been overlooked for so long and saying what do we do about this? And and I can tell you, I've been moderating townhouse for some of these unions and locals, and like everyone is really wanting to find a way to change. And so uh, I just hope that we are successful in doing that because, um, you know, as we all know, something else could happen uh, in the next few months, and and just completely shifts the conversation and, and the spotlight, and then we'll come back to this in ten years and and still be saying the same thing. So uh, I hope that's not the case, but 
That's my personal opinion. I think we're in a moment of overcorrection and we have to break bones and reset, but everyone has to be willing to do that. And I have experienced, like you said, um, Denise, like a lot of the talk about it, but like, who is about it? Like, like, it, cause it's uncomfortable and you have to relinquish power and, you know, uh, sort of take a look at your supremacy and be like, oh, okay. So the way I note, it maybe is not the way I should know. Like, like sometimes uh, th these notes have other eyes to us or uh, the way we, we look at, you know, a, a, a production slate, like in a stereotypical way. Like there's so many ways um, uh, that we're going to have to sh like break bones and re and reshift and it's uncomfortable because it's ha that's what's happening to the country too. So, um, so this is, this is a big moment. And I, I feel like this overcorrection um, moment is everybody has to be willing to do it. And sometimes, um, it's cosmetic and, and just for the optics. I, I have seen that and, and I, we, I'm totally just agreeing with you, Denise. It's like we're in a moment to be like, is this a, like a movement or a trend? Like, is this gonna stay? Um, I'm, I'm um, because of what's happening um, this month, this, you know, I, I can't vote. I'm not a citizen of the country, but I'm like watching like this. I, um, because of what's happening in the country, I feel like that sometimes is reflected in, in our industry. And also, Tanya, I have a question for you regarding uh, staffing your shows with all members of the Latinx community. Was there pushback? You know what? This is the formula that I, like, I was so blessed to be in this formula. My executive at STARS, her name is Marta Fernandez. That's it. That's the formula. I mean, you have a champion, someone like you, in the castle, you know, championing you and, like, fighting those battles for you. I don't even know what battles she had to fight for me. So that... It was all yes and yes you can have an all latinx writer of of a lot of beginning writers um yes none of my directors had ever done tv except for one at, at the whole season including myself you know um my cinematographer because it's not just like it's all the story told. my cinematographer this afro latina that had never run her own um you know uh camera department but she was ready so we just had to like hold each other's hand uh, and hold on to Marta too. You know what I mean? So it was like a lot of hand holding, and that's now I can't get her. She's fancy now. Like she's she's off. <laughs> but like, but that's how you um sort of hold on to each other and lift each other up it, it, in that way. But I I don't know if it would have happened if uh, my executive did not have Z at the end of her last name. You know. Uh, that's wonderful. I'm so happy you opened the door. That's wonderful. Um, okay, so we're gonna uh, pivot a little bit. Unless anyone has anything else to add. Okay. Great. So, um, yes or no? Is it possible to write without bias? Denise? No. <laughs> no. Tan Tanya? No. Okay, great. Uh, so, <laughs> it's unanimous. <laughs> Is it possible to minimize, or how do you minimize a bias in writing then? I'm not looking at bias as a bad thing right now. <laughs> so like um, my bias is I, I'm, I'm, I'm like, it's a, um, a synonym for my perspective. So like I, I, you know, and my bias has been missing. So like I, right now I'm not thinking bias is a bad thing. I, I, so, and I, you know, I'm not thinking like someone from the dominant culture, but um, I don't, I, you know, to be as inclusive uh, um, as you can, but like, you're never going to, take away your your point of view which is bias mm -hmm. you know um and actually those are the i mean the, those are the shows uh insecure atlanta fleabag those are the shows you want these biases you know like a uh, of a, a, a point of view you know but um but it's 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 um how they treat otherized uh communities and identities you know like with what with what kindness um but yeah i don't think you can be unbiased i think bias is a reality I think, um, and it's better if we accept it. And I think where we need to be having the uncomfortable conversations is when our bias is dangerous, when our bias can, uh, is a weapon in many ways. And those are the things that we have to check ourselves on. But the, just as Tanya said, if we remove all bias, then we're, gonna have no, we're not gonna have anything left. So uh, I think it's important to just sort of be able to be open to receiving criticism or not even criticism, but just having, being comfortable with discomfort and having conversations. And 
and that's it. Well, actually, to your point, Rena, when is bias dangerous? What does that look like? You know, a uh, good question. I mean, tough question. I, I think it ha it's dealing in racial tropes, dealing with um, stereotypes, things like that, perpetuating broken belief systems. Um, when a portrayal of a certain type of character, when a portrayal of a person who represents or comes from a certain background or culture or socioeconomic background or educational background or um, physical ableness. Um, when these things are, when we have these characters that aren't well-rounded 360 degree characters and we're relying on these generalizations, um, I think we have to understand the ramifications of that, even if it's as small as um, instilling and creating a, a germ of bad self-esteem for a person and just understanding the weight of our actions and how the portrayals of various people are going to affect um, whether it's people who represent that marginalized group or even people of a different background where what are we what are we instilling in someone in in their in this portrayal Great answer, thank you. Um, Tanya and whoever wants to answer, what is your approach to writing with equity in mind? Um, it, I, right now, everything is just through my point of view and I'm very aware of that that's expansive. Um, it, it um, just because of where I, I sit in the identity spectrum, not just as a queer, but like, a um, you know, that Latinidad is, vast right like uh, we're afro latinx we're indigenous latinx we're i'm mestiza like all, all that um and that includes a lot of identity so it's not just you know center so like um as i as i'm moving forward like i'm doing right now i'm writing a london thing um which is like you know but it's still mexican so like it, it uh it it's just bec because i i've been otherized for for so long there's like a a natural way to like be inclusive i'm that's i'm generalizing but like um i'm just aware of that also i get taken to task on twitter all the time and i am very aware of that i was like oh my god i'm gonna get dragged am i gonna get dragged on twitter i that's like a good i know that's like a good um litmus test for me lately i was like no okay maybe i won't get i mean you're gonna get dragged on twitter anyway but like um i do think about that like um if it might happen that's a great panel, what to do when Twitter comes for you. Comes and for they you. come, they come for you. Yes, they will. Yeah. Um, the you know, I'll, I'll answer this, but uh, you know, keep in mind, I'm a non-writing producer. I don't write. Kudos to everyone who, who has the patience and who can do it. Um, but I love storytelling. And, and as a producer, right, I, I say this all the time, but I think we have a responsibility when working with writers to always be keeping equity in mind, right? And and to and as we know, the process, you know, producers develop first, they go to the studio and they give their notes, but then the producers are in there with the writers and helping to develop and give notes and 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 have, you know, you should have some kind of conscious awareness about equity. And so if I'm developing something with the writer and, and I'm realizing that there is, you know, a character of color that is um, getting kind of uh, uh, pushed aside or just not really having a three-dimensional um, um, arc or just something like, and you're just like, well, why, like, who is this person and why do they just, why are they just black and they have, you know, no agency in the story. And to be able to point that out and to say, let's talk about this. How do we bring them out to the forefront and make sure that our characters in any script um, you know, feel like real characters. And again, as a producer, I have a responsibility to point that out and, and talk to our writers about it, right? And I think to just kind of push that aside, you know, you're not being equitable in any case and you're also not thinking inclusively. And so um, that's how I view it from my standpoint. Um, you know, I'm not a writer, so it's, it's a little bit of a different answer, but I do think producers also have to share in that weight and, and we also fall on that sword as well. Great answer. So what tools, support, resources do you as producers and development execs use and um, to provide to your writers so that they're able to write with equity in mind? Earlier we spoke about a diverse hire kind of bearing the weight of representing being that one person. So, um, you know, that or 
there's a like time money consultants spell check for bias those are some examples mm -hmm. uh, i'll just speak for us you know being a studio exec and having experience in development at a production company you know there's always an ability to seek and access consultants for specialty purposes and sometimes it's you know you're doing a world war ii story and so you want a world war ii historian and the same the same i suppose can can apply for cultural representation um there there are various organizations out there that have been around and more more appearing whether it's something like a harness or um cape or things and so there's a lot of resources out there unfortunately people have to go and find them but if we're you know kind of just circling back to a lot of our previous conversations if we are constructing a writer's room in a very intentional way perhaps we won't need to use those outside resources but occasionally we we need to and i think it's just about asking asking for help when you need it identifying when you're in over your head and just doing the research yourself and figuring out what are my best options to you know to tell the story accurately okay um how do you handle a writer who is resistant to um, these equity measures or even feedback Sorry, I was going to say the person that came to mind and then said, um, well, they'll have to have a real reckoning and, you know, we'll, we'll likely have to part ways. Um, I mean, look, I I am a producer and someone who is very passionate and very honest about these uh, these conversations that we're having. And personally, I just think it's it's really hard if you're a writer and you're fully resistant to changing the way you look at at your your own life, the way you look at telling stories. And if you just quite honestly can't see it or be willing to to change your ways. And, and again, not to attack people, but to be, have the, the honesty of saying, you know what, I'm aware of my anti-racist bias. Is I'm aware that I can I do not see the world the same way as you. So help me help you, and let's like let's find a way to mediate this. Um, honestly, if a writer can't do that, I'm just not here to work with them. Why waste my time, right? And you can only do so much. But if someone is resistant to changing the way that they um, who they I don't say who they are, but quite honestly, all writers are writing from who they are. Um, then it's just not going to work out, and and I'm not willing to sacrifice my own values to um, to work with someone who who won't be willing to uh, to help change. So, yeah, I agree with Denise. I mean, you kind of try to identify early, and it's not just about these issues, but it's just in general when you are on the non-writing side, um, but working with story and helping to shape the story. When you come across an individual that's showing some early signs of um, just not collaborating. I mean, that's a that's a red flag right there just across the board, whether it's about story and character that has nothing to do with issues of equity, um, and, but certainly when it has to do with issues of equity. And so there's just, that's a reality. Now, sometimes some sneak in that you just, you thought you knew and you put them through your little tests and, um, you know, threw some things at them early just to see what they would say. And then now you're in the weeds and, and here you are. And those are moments where there's strength in numbers, right? So you got to get creative with, with how you approach people and and with any like when there's conflict or disagreement in any way you know it's the same way that we ask for people to have empathy when they are trying to write our stories i think we as um people who work in development have to have empathy towards the other person and so part of that is understanding okay where is this person coming from why are they resisting this um so if i i think i'm making a point and trying to engage this person in a dialogue and they're shutting me off, shutting me down. Um, is there a different way that I can approach this conversation? And if maybe there, I can't identify the way for me to have that conversation, is there a different person in the process who might be better tasked with this? Um, and so that's where when you have, you know, for me as a studio exec, I work with producers like Denise in the same way that I work with writers and writing producers like Tanya. And so we're, it takes a village to make a TV show, and um, you know sometimes you have to ask for help from your colleagues too. I'm, I'm too um, not lenient, but like I respect writers above anything. So I, I they go, it goes. Uh, I, it takes a lot, you know. Like mm -hmm. I give a lot of passes, which people are like, you know, um, it's not great. I don't like to like. 
I just love writers, you know, and um, sometimes we're difficult. <laughs> and I give a pass for a long time. And then when it's, when it's just evident, it's not going to happen. You know, it's not going to work out, but it, but it's, but I give too many passes. So like, I need a little bit of these ladies, like less mama bear or whatever it is. Um, then, um, cause I'm like, I make excuses, but like, it's not sustainable. I need to like learn. <laughs> okay. That's fair. So what is the difference between prejudice content and content that explores the authentic interaction between people of different backgrounds? Oh my God, it's a gut feeling, you know, you know what it is, but it's, um, it's a version. It's, it's, yeah. it's somebody else's version of, of the thing that's supposed to be authentic. It's, it's, how do you, um, it's a not fully realized version, but, um, but sometimes, you know, if it's a, a quick character, it can, like, it, yeah, I, it, that's a really tough question. Yeah, well, I, I'm trying to think of it too, for me, like, I, th I think the best way I can answer it is, even, is, is taking our show Insecure, for example, right? Like there's stuff, our show, we we say it time and time again, but it is, it is just happens to be a Black show about regular Black people in Inglewood, right? And we are not trying to over explain to anyone what it means to be a Black person. We aren't trying to take any route to um, classify the stereotypical dialogue or roles or, or, or um, storylines that may feel like, oh, okay, I know these Black people. It's like, these are just people. And I think when there's prejudice and, and the shows that are inauthentic, right, it sometimes comes from a place of what Tanya was touching on, which is like, this is how a Black person talks. This is how a Latinx person talks. This is what their house looks like, right? And there's this, 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 I, this bias of, of a prejudice of like what their home is. And, and I don't know, like I've always seen it one-sided, right? And you're just like, why do we always look like we live in a place with two chairs and a couch? Like, why is it like, why can't we see um, a, a family that is a family that lives in a middle class home? Because like, I know, you know, people of color who just have regular lives. And so it's this idea of prejudice around what people's perspective of these communities of color look like and talk like and sound like and not being authentic to realizing that in every single community, it's not a monolith, right? I, I get frustrated even from a Latinx standpoint, Tanya, as I'm sure you do, when like they put a, put everyone who, who speaks Spanish into one group and primarily also say that they're Mexican, right? Like they, they don't really showcase the diaspora of, uh, of what it really means to be Latinx or, or Spanish. And there, and there's so many different sectors of storytelling in there that um, I think finds its way into a prejudice side because people um, put their assumptions on the context of the world. So that's how I kind of like delineate it where like, again, if I can use an example of how to not do it, I look at insecure because it just is, it just is, so. Yeah, I mean, it's it's almost impossible to answer this question because there's just so many layers of it, right? Yeah. It's in the germ of the idea, like the initial idea itself, prejudice can exist there. Um, it's in the portrayal of the people, prejudice can exist there. It can be in just a, side, you know, one episode character, it can be in a main character, um, it can be in the way in which the relationship is set up between characters. Um, so there's so much to examine that I don't think it can be boiled down to, uh, you know, prejudice in a show or not in a show. Um, and that's why it really does take a village because there's so many different things that you have to kind of check and be aware of and be conscious of. Okay, great answers. What are some elements of an authentic character then? I can give examples. Like, do they have their own arc? They're not the only one or the token. They're not suffering or dying. They have depth. They're not stereotyped. They're not magical or in service to, um, you know, another character. Examples like that. Well, you just said them all. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you, you said a good chunk of them. Um, <laughs> I was providing inspiration, but um, I'm sure <laughs> if, if I've answered the question, then you can provide examples of how you've employed. Um, Complicated. I, <laughs> um, I, um, I know that when Be That came along, um, you know, we either have to be on TV, like sometimes when we um, handle our own stories, we have to be the model minority, you know, and because we're trying to overcorrect these like stereotypes of being like M13 and, and maids and like, which we are those things, but like, it's like, those are the only things that we've seen. So then you, we go the other way and we like, you know, color with primary colors sometimes. And um, I think 
something radical to do is to show us in our ugliness too, because it's our complexity, you know? So like, I, um, I really wanted to show in my show, just these girls are not likable all the time, but that's because we haven't gotten a chance to see complex portrayals like that, that, that becomes a, a radical, you know, thing. Um, to show to show us in our ugliness is to show us in our realness you know uh because like we we haven't gotten a chance to have a lot of uh, moments where we just exist you know we have to like represent something a lot like i mean like represent a uh, um you know an archetype or or or, or be uh for uh the purpose of something like we're you know um so i think when we can have our complicated um breaking bads and flea bags that we're like we could have like a and genre and todo eso. like i feel like that's when, that's when it's like oh okay um we're human beings to the to this industry because it's so important because like being here in london right now it's so crazy that <laughs> nobody knows what a mexican is like like there's no context but um hollywood exports my identity a version of me and it's so dangerous that that whatever has been exported um is the only information they have on me and, and most of the times that that has not been held by me you know so it's somebody's version of me that india gets that london gets you know that like it is really it's 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 again really dangerous so um yeah mm. Okay. All right. How do you provide feedback so that biased or damaging projects are caught or altered before going through to production as we've seen fallout from, you know, projects that made it through the pipeline. So how do you stop that, prevent that from happening? I mean, you know, like I said, it's, <laughs> it's um, you know, it's, it, as we know, the development process, it's, it, it's a process, right? It goes through several hands, several eyes, several conversations. And so, when you talk about how do you stop it, I, I think Rena mentioned it earlier where it's just, you know, whether it's the producer on the studio side, but like someone has to come in and basically raise their hand and say, we need to talk about this. This needs to be a discussion and it needs to be a collaborative um, and collective discussion, right? Um, it's usually best kind of addressed that way versus like, you know, having the, the, the singling out the writer and having that one sidebar conversation. Sometimes I think to awareness and, and and change, like especially if you see something that's biased, comes from addressing the whole. Because you know, at this point, you're assuming that it's not just one writer; so there's a writer's room. And I do think there's something to um, be learned from when you're addressing a situation like that and addressing the entire uh, the, the entire room. You know, and so that they all can work together to make sure that happens. Because in my opinion, if that if it's gotten to me and it's still in there, then this entire room is responsible, not just the writer of the episode, right? Because they've worked on it together. So it needs to be a collective um, conversation that then, you know, at some point, hopefully changes um, before it goes to air or before it gets made. It's always too late. Once it's made, it's too late. It's too late. Yeah, I mean, for me personally, try to call it out early um, mm -hmm. before like as early as possible, which and then at that point you can kind of do a softer sort of call out to it of just like, hey, just want to point this out. Just want to make sure we're conscious of understanding what we're walking into and, and when we approach this, that there's awareness to um, to the potential that this could turn out not great, you know? Um, and sometimes things escalate or it comes to you and it's a little bit more baked into things and you're not in the position to be able to do the kind of nicey nicey, like, eh. um, and in those cases, like you gotta just go in and you gotta go in and you gotta throw it out there, but you know, do my best to be sensitive and and you got you have to kind of read the room. It's that empathy that goes both ways, right? So mm -hmm. if, if I'm kind of shocking the system, um, you know, sometimes for me, my approach might be, I know this was a lot. You don't have to respond to this right now. If you want to go take some time, digest, think about it, then let's come back together and let's have a conversation about this. Um, and that's sort of the, the, the last resort um, when you kind of have to really hit somebody hard with something that's really uncomfortable is to understand the weight of that and give that person a little bit of time and and give them the benefit of the doubt and then be able to come back together when they've had a little time and space to think about what you're saying and then hopefully make adjustments. 
Okay, great. Um, so how does the green lighting process help or hinder increasing diverse content? Well, um, you want to talk about the elephant in the room <laughs> about who's on the other side green lighting because that's we could start there. Um, you know, the, the truth for me is, is man, it's an it's a problem. We can't talk about inclusivity um, on the creator level, on the writer's level, on the director's level, without actually also looking at the other side of the room and saying, well, how do we increase diversity and inclusivity in the executive rooms, on the development teams, on the production teams, and who has the power to greenlight our stories, right? And there's something inherently wrong to me about creating change down the the, the system, the food chain of, of creating stories, but at the top level, not having change reflected there. Because at the end of the day, if they are not culturally connecting to the stories that we're trying to tell, if they are not having someone on their team who is rooting for the project, like Tanya mentioned, Marta was like, you know, it, 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 we're never going to get anywhere because we'll continue to be fighting the same fight of trying to tell someone how our why our stories are important, which I'm tired of. And you just really want someone who is going to see the value in, you know, in the stories that you're trying to create. And, and again, we're not saying, let's just push all stories through. It's, they're, they're good stories, right? Like you, you should be fighting for the good stories. But um, that is such a problem that I, I'm trying to understand right now and that everyone's trying to hire diverse and it's it's kind of it's been a wild year to see these executives kind of shuffle around but then they're all hitting the same um, pipeline issue and recognizing that they have not empowered and helped promote and create a pipeline for execs of color and so now that we're facing this reckoning how do i find a high level executive when the, the majority of them all have jobs right now so what do you do right and and that's where i actually want to see the system challenge a little bit more because uh, I think if they just glance over and think, oh, we've hired the one, we're good, we can move on, like, it's not enough. And so what I hope is that at every high level, you know, who's pushing the green light is that it is a collective, um, of, of, it's a collective group um, that is very much a diverse group um, that consists of, of, of the studios and the networks. It shouldn't just be one person at the end of the day, but I've said my piece. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we always hear people say there's a risk when it comes to diversifying, whether it comes to writing, staffing, funding projects, marketing projects, there's always a risk. What do you think the risk is? Well, this industry is a risk, but like everything's <laughs> a risk. So like that, even that statement, but yeah, I, um, that's just the unknown. Like that's why people hire who they have worked with. Right. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, oh, well, I, they're going to deliver. I know that, but like, and if for decades, you've only hired people that look like you, you know, the, the, the dominant culture, then you're not going to let anyone come in. It, anything's a risk. I mean, this industry is risky, but I, I, I think that's about um, perspective because um, mm -hmm. I think that's about perspective and, and, and fear and laziness. Cause like, uh, like, you know, we staffed, all our department heads were female um, and top, top to bottom. And, and we like, People started calling me. I was like, "Do you have a, an inclusivity writer?" No, mm -hmm. you just do it. You just have to. It's like a like a little bit extra work to do, but but not that like it's not impossible. So many of us do it, you know. But like it's like there's a like a, a laziness and a and a fear. Um, but like really, everything's a risk. I I I, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I can agree more. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I couldn't agree more because it is it is a risky business at the end of the day, no matter which way you look at it. But there, for whatever reason, there tends to be a resistance to that, right? And and thinking that we are lower risk, and, and let's be honest, a lot of it comes down to dollars and cents, and and this old old way of of thinking that diverse stories don't make money, right? And and so let's talk about how to mitigate the risk. It's around, it's about people getting around this idea that stories other than <clears throat> from a, a white male gaze or white characters will not make the company any money. And I think that's where um, it's bullish and it's wrong. And um, that's where they're putting the risk on. And it's just, it's, it's just not real. Um, as we have seen, especially in these last few years, um, and so for whatever it takes, it's just, it's like, you're going to take the risk anyways. You've spent a hundred million dollars on a Tom Cruise money. You're taking a risk. What's the difference, especially when we're fighting for our little $20 million movies of, of taking the risk on, on betting on those stories. So, um, yeah, I, I agree with Tanya. I just think it's, it's 
doesn't make any sense because it, at the end of the day, it's all a risk. So um, I don't, I don't accept that as an excuse. Yeah, that thought process doesn't make any sense. But part of the part of the issue that we have oftentimes as people of color is that that risk is not articulated in that way, even mm -hmm. if that's the essence of what the argument is on the other side. And so there's always a way to construct an argument for just about anything. Um, and so oftentimes you have it's it's you think you know you, you have a sense of what the person is really resisting um, on the other end where you're receiving resistance, but it's, they're not articulating it in truth and in reality, it, what they're really feeling. And so you have to go through a process of debunking on the arguments that you're receiving. And I think it's just about not taking, it, just not saying yes all the time and working through things because nobody's ever come to me and and said oh well it's just it's it's risky if we if we hire more people of color um because that would be a ludicrous thing to say and i think people have identified that it's not appropriate to say that but they're but where we're stopping short sometimes in this business is the identification that it's not savory to say that that it's not appropriate to say that but not reflecting on why it's the inappropriateness of that belief system. So the sooner we can have more open conversations and really open the channel, the more that we can better address the heart of the problems. And part of, I think, for all of us on this panel, what what's difficult about our jobs is trying to navigate this and trying to fight what is a, a, it's a bit of a broken status quo, but without being able to talk about the real issues. Wow, wonderful, thank you. Um, so what is your call to action for fellow content creators and influencers as a way to move forward and with equity in mind? Right now, I sorry, no, you, you. Oh, please. I'm, um, I'm about creating communities uh, because like there's strength in, 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 when, in when we lean and it's not just so much numbers, but like when we lean on each other. So like, um, um, I was talking about it earlier, the, the Untitled Latinx Project is, it's like all the Latina showrunners and, and, and you know, producers in, in Hollywood, we get together because we, we haven't had a generation of, of Latinx showrunners that have um, sort of mentored us and stuff. We didn't have that, you know? So like a lot of us are, are going out of the first, so like that, and then there's uh, with UCP, I'm, I'm, I have an incubator that I'm starting that I'm so excited about that we're still creating, so I can't like, fully go into it, but it's exciting that because of the moment, um, like UCP is giving, throwing money at it. And that's like being about it, you know, that's, re that's really important. Um, so like, um, I feel like for me, just personally from my ac activist background in Chicago, like I, like um, forming communities and then, and then empowering us to make change and you you'll see later on today, something that we're going to put out and as a community like that. And, um, and I think, that will um, hope hopefully will um, um, permeate throughout and, and it, it'll, it'll uh, like emp empower creatively and as producers and stuff, you know, just like, cause, um, cause for so long we just sort of been like, um, it's just not empowered. So at, at least for, for me, that's how I've been um, just getting us together and, and, and creating, you know, empowering uh, movements. Yeah. I was going to touch on something similar um, to Tanya, but um, it, it is, <clears throat> excuse me, it is about opening the door for others in a real way too, right? And, and making sure that um, if you are a producer or you're, or you're someone in power and you look around the room and you realize that, um, you know, you haven't been allowing a space for others to come in and, and to be, um, to learn and grow from and, and to be in our pipeline to begin with. Um, all it takes is you taking an action and, and taking a, gest a gesture of doing that for someone else, right? And that is, as we know, this, this town is so relationship-based, it's so relationship-oriented, and so that's where it starts. And so if you uh, find yourself realizing that you um, haven't been acting in that way, I think that's the easiest thing and the first thing you can do to start with, right? Look at your assistance ranks, look at your executive ranks, look at who's in your office, and if you recognize that oh, I've never hired a person of color in this room. Well, then you could start there and start to change the way you are hiring in your own room. So um, that's one call to action. And the other thing when, when I talk about pipeline, 
you know, when you are hiring for your projects, whether it's your writers or your directors or anything, please make sure all your candidates are, you, you are bringing forth not just the best candidates, but also candidates who are inclusive, right? And I'm not saying that like, you always have to have all women of color or anything, but like, if you are find yourself interviewing directors for your show and you are interviewing all white men or all white directors, that is a problem. You are not doing anything to help create um, any part of the change. And so I just think having that awareness and, and having that smaller call to action, which is the, the, the awareness and the reckoning of, oh, okay, I, I could play a part in this. So let me make sure I'm opening the door so that way other people at least have the opportunity. Denise, I have to say that you sat down with me and that was huge. And that's part of this, oh, yeah. the first part that you said, like, because when I was like, I think I'm going to go in search of something like, you know, so I can have a slate and just to get a little, you know, to get more. And you just, you just broke it down for me. And that was, she had breakfast with me and it was like, mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for that. Cause I was like, oh, you can do that. You know, it was, <laughs> we're just like saying, oh, blah, 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 blah. and it was like amazing. So um, that, you. that that's opening door. Like, uh, a door of possibility it was for me so that was yeah. a very important breakfast for me oh say. thank you tanya but also it's you know like you said it's building a collective right building yeah. empowerment within and, and bringing people together who all want to see a different way that we work and at the end of the day no one can do that alone and i believe in the power of support and and obviously what tanya's referencing is like i shared with her things that east and i've done in the past and the things we've learned and like that just that that conversation um like you said it, like knowing that it helped but it's like yeah this is what this is all about we should all be at the table helping each other out and not just living in our own little silos and and feeling like we're we're in the fight alone because we're not and there is strength in numbers there's powers in numbers and there's and there's strength in being able to point to things that have existed and the success of them too and i think that allows people to realize that you're not just making things up for whatever reason. So I'm sorry. Sorry, Rena, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, all good. Love hearing you guys talk. Um, I mean, for me, when you asked that question, Anissa, like my thought is the call to action is how do we take this moment and this movement and create sea change? So it's not a fleeting thing. It's not this moment that we look back at. Um, I think many of us have experienced some level of a similar social thing that happened for me in my background growing up in LA, the LA riots informed so much of my viewpoint on the world. And what also informs so much of my viewpoint on the world was the lack of change that happened as a result of that. So this moment, we how many more times do we have to go through things like this to have important conversations? And I think what we're really starting to identify now is that there's something broken with the foundation of thinking. There's something broken with the foundation of institutions that ev if everything is built on a broken foundation, then it there is no way to create meaningful, lasting change. So it's a really deep commitment. Anyone who showed up to a protest and brought a sign that said Black Lives Matter, they, these people need to understand this is a lifelong commitment. This is a lifelong pledge. And part of I think having welcoming these uncomfortable conversations to really start to address the root of the issues, not the surface issues, but the root of them that are not always pleasant um, is also to forgive one another, right? I'm not always gonna say things the right way. Yes, I am going to offend people. Uh, that's a reality. I accept that. I hope everybody else accepts that. And if we can all come to the table and just come with the spirit of we want to be better, we want to do better, how can we do that? Um, that's important. Empty promises, empty gestures, you know, the NFL saying Black Lives Matter, well, where the fuck is Colin Kaepernick? So it, it's, it's, that's again, it's just, we can't just, just say, oh, we wanna change. No, we, we all have to change and we all have to be a part of changing. And so what is it to be an ally? You know, this, this term that's thrown around all the time, but creating community as Tanya and Denise say is wildly important and mixed communities and having the important conversations and really getting to the heart of the matter because this is a, a crack in a door and it's not only time to just blow the door open, but it's time to dismantle the wall. Yeah. 
and take it all down. Burn yeah. it all down. No, I know. I was like, Rena, so many quotes. I'm stealing from her. <laughs> wow, that was amazing. Go for it. Thank you. Um, you know, I've been listening to what everyone has said, and I have kind of been taking notes. And if we were to create some unofficial um, toolkit, so to speak, um, for, you know, working, writing, collaborating with equity in mind, you know, so far I've gotten open to collaboration, empathy, community creation, building a collection, uh, collective, deep commitment, forgiveness, willingness to change. Is there anything that you'd like to add or even to highlight? Yeah, I think it's time that it, on just whether it's individual or collective behavior, but I think it's time for behavior to align with the moral belief systems that people claim that they have. Yes. Agreed. So real. Be about it. Okay, great. Um, and I would also like to um, recommend that if anybody has any questions, uh, now is the time to, uh, to post them. So I will be taking them right after this question. Um, and hopefully this is a feel good moment. We talked earlier about Twitter dragging uh, people. <laughs> so how about the flip? When you have featured underrepresented stories and characters, um, what response have you gotten from your viewers, colleagues? How, how, have, how has your stories, the stories that you've told, how, that in, how has that impacted people? For me, it, it's been um, really fulfilling to um, get the reaction from brown queers that have never seen themselves represented, uh, especially masculine of center um, um, females that, um, and, and non-binary people that are like, oh, I've never seen someone like me that wasn't like the butt of the joke or uh, like it was a fully fledged um, human being. And that, that's, been, that's been really fulfilling. Um, I wanna do more of that. Yeah, I think for me, it's been, you know, when Insecure, especially during the pandemic, but like when, <clears throat> excuse me, Insecure is airing its new episodes on Sundays, going online and seeing like the spats that are happening, but it's about our characters and what they're doing. And it has nothing to do with their, their culture, the world. It literally is so story driven um, because somehow we found out people, it's so easy to hate Molly this season. So like that, that to me is a satisfying, gratifying feeling because again, we've done our job correctly and that we're servicing the story with our show and not trying to service a certain particular type of culture or, or, or shine a spotlight on how to, again, how to be black, right? Like all of that is not even talked about as much as it's, <clears throat> excuse me, our characters and, and what they're going through and, and the fact that people feel so deeply and strongly about <laughs> what our characters are doing. Um, that to me is satisfying. It feels like we, we've, you know, we are doing our job the right way. Um, and I, I also just like to add a, a small tangent tidbit that's still related, but like I've been recently saying how I have a 10 year old niece um, who was super multi-ethnic, lots of different nationalities. However, um, when Little, the film Little came out last year, she became obsessed and has watched this film over a hundred times and is now the biggest Marseille Martin fan and started wa uh, watching Blackish, right? Like fully just consumed. And it dawned on me and I told Issa that like, oh, I get it. It's not like, it's not that Marseille isn't cute and super talented, it's because she, hasn't had anyone that uh, represents who, who she can identify with, right? And she's 10. And there's, and it's not a, a, a mistake that she's just, you know, loving this, this comedy film. It's because like, when's the last time have we seen a commercial studio film with a young adult that is a, of color as the lead before Little, right? And so it's just that idea that like, God, representation matters so much, right? Like now I'm just so happy that that film exists for her to see herself before she becomes a full-fledged teenager and becomes mad at the world because she's never been able to identify with, with any characters in any of the stories she loves. So anyways, that's just another example of, of again, the importance and seeing something um, go so far um, with just the fact that it exists. Yeah, I think there's a, such an importance for people to, especially people who previously feel invisible in media to feel seen. Um, whether, you know, through a character or, and, and it doesn't, it, it's interesting because it doesn't always come from an apples to apples way. Um, and for those of us who come from a mixed race background or just very untradi untraditional backgrounds, it's, it's hard for us to see ourselves in media on screen. But what's interesting too, is that when we, when we represent different types of people from different backgrounds, 
um, with an intentionality of authenticity. I think what we sometimes find is that um, although we're celebrating our differences in those moments and so celebrating the diversity of backgrounds, that we're also creating abilities for people to realize the connections too. And a way to relate to somebody of a different background um, that you may not realize. So maybe you, maybe someone sees themselves, a version of themselves in a vastly different character, a character of a different gender, of a different sexuality, of a different race or cultural background. And that's something that is in that way, programming can bring people together as much as we celebrate our differences. Terrific, I agree. So we have our first question and friendly reminder, feel free to send them in. Um, quick question about casting with LGBTQ. IA specifically, um, is it important to cast someone who is actually part of that community? And how important is it to have every character be that way in their actual non-acting life? I, I, I know that I really tried to um, cast um, queer people for queer roles. Sometimes in the casting process, not sometimes, you can't ask. Um, so. Um, you can put it in the breakdown, you can try to search. That's why a lot of our like key queer characters I found through the theater or that I knew or that I just so that representation could be, you know, um, accurate that way. But it's it's really hard in the casting process to be like, because yeah, it's not legal to be like, so are you queer, you know? Um, but I, to me, it's really important for, you know, um, the, the character of Eddie, who's a, you know, a, a butch uh, to be played by someone who presents that way. Um, you know, a, a, a stud is, is representing a stud, you know, like I, it's, it's for, uh, because we um, have not seen ourselves that way for so long, it, it does become really important. So I, 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 but it's not always possible, you know. Yeah, uh, I would agree with that, Tanya. And it's like, you do the best that you can, but at the, the end result, hopefully, is you do have some representation and not none, right? I think that's where the mistake lies when you can, if you do a LGBTQ show and all of a sudden you have absolutely no performers who identify as such, that is a very glaring issue. Um, and sometimes one is not enough. So I would say fight to have as much as um, possible, but, um, you know, sometimes it's, I don't want to say it's never impossible, but just given the challenges that we face within the casting process, it's, it is, you know, it's a really high bar, um, depending on the story, so. For me personally, I don't have a blanket answer to this because I think that if we have the conversation to say that we need to have LGBTQ plus people only playing LGBTQ plus characters, then there are other arguments that can also exist with that reasoning. Um, I think one could justify then that an LGBTQ plus person can't play a straight person, right? And so then what limitations are we creating for that, for actors in that community? Um, and so if, if everyone's only able to play the exact version of themselves, um, you know, the opposite is true. So that's, that's my personal standpoint, but if we're, you know, I think just hiring the best person for the job and, and really intentionally when we are portraying marginalized people going into a situation of seeking authenticity, authentic representations, um, sometimes that's, I'm trying to figure out even how to close my statement because it's, it, to me, it's also, it's also open and um, hard to define. Understandable, thank you. When we are putting together our list of showrunners for our projects that the streamers will approve and they're tiny, how do we change the narrative um, with various CEOs whose names I won't mention, uh, you know, big companies, big corporations? Man, I, I point to, again, to go back to the pipeline problem, right? Is that, let's be honest, they're, they're just, truthfully is not enough, uh, there, there is not enough diverse showrunners at a certain caliber, at a certain level that you just know will automatically get the project green light. And then even if there, there, there isn't an increase in numbers, the majority of them are stuck in deals are more exclusive somewhere else. And so you already are coming into um, a situation where it's, it's, it's a lot harder 
to go to those studio networks with the, the list, right? Um, and they're not going to include them because they're not thinking of them first. But I think it's, it's all about being creative and smart about how you approach that conversation and how you make sure that, like I said, you're giving other people opportunities. There is absolutely no reason why a writer who is at a producer level who has just a little bit of experience cannot step into the showrunner experience, uh, showrunner position if they have seen and learned about what a showrunner does from their own experience, right? Like it's just that catch 22 and this idea that we are not creating enough opportunities and pipeline for promotion in a writer's room to allow people to get to that level. And so the issue then stands when a studio network will refuse to hire someone as a showrunner, even if they haven't done it before, because now you're just creating um, the, the systemic problem that we're facing. So it's one of those things that I think you can challenge and again, be creative and say, okay, well, I'm going to take this person and they're going to be a co-EP slash supervisor. And we're going to take this baby writer and we're going to put them together and, and know that and trust that these, um, these two individuals will get us there, right? And be willing to, we talked about risk, be willing to take that risk. Well, whatever risk you may see in that, you have to let it be, uh, you, you just have to let it be given the opportunity. Otherwise, like, what are you, what are you even doing? You know, like, I, I don't know. I just, I just am so against that because it's frustrating and it's the worst catch 22 that's out there, to be honest. Yeah, I was a co-producer level. I'd only been in Hollywood three years when I got handed Vida without a babysitter, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which is very rare. But so like, um, it, it, it's, it's so possible. You just have to have people willing to take the risk. And because what you're talking about this pipeline, you talk, it, it's true right now, because of, because this shit is systemic, we have not, we, we just don't have the people that on paper look like, oh, like, you know, oh, I, these are sure bets, but there's a lot of people ready, you know? Mm -hmm. So, and that's, you just have to like expand your mind a little bit. With that. I agree. Uh, okay. Um, what advice do you have to people who are the diversity hires? <laughs> first uh -oh. of all, they need to, um, sorry, I'm always like answering first. Um, th th with this one, it, it, nobody, this concept of the diversity hire for the studios, nobody implements it. Nobody trains the showrunner, the number two, on how to treat the so like nobody knows what it is you know all you hear is you have no value because you don't cost anything like that and so you carry that and then and then it, it becomes part of the culture of the room so like i feel like there there needs to be like an awareness raising of of of, of what it is um and and not treat um the diversity hired like a free writer without value you know mm -hmm. uh, and also like you said like it was said before like not otherize and tokenize uh and and make them be the ambassador for every like every other eyes identity you know like that there's there's like a way that we have to like enforce it and implement that that position you know uh if it's going to continue because i it is a way for some of us to get into the industry you know mm -hmm. uh, but then they keep putting us um they keep like making us repeat staff writer like four times Mm -hmm. You know, they won't because we they want us to be, keep being free, just valued, you know, not being valued. Sorry. <laughs> PTSD, PTSD. <laughs> <laughs> and also in that vein, Tanya, how did you navigate from going to diversity higher to where you are now? And I'm I can still navigating it. <laughs> See, I was still like, uh, I don't know. I, I just kept doing it, but um, I just make sure now that I have rooms that I do that they are no one has ever other eyes that everybody has value um you know and in in my rooms the, the script coordinator the assistant the PA they can all you know participate I don't know it's it's um I came into that first room I came into was very like old Hollywood old TV like whatever your level that's how much you speak and I was like well, that's I feel like that's not um the best way to like those old you know dinosaur ideas um I don't know how I really do think a champion a champion is was the key here um because I if not this wouldn't have happened somebody who saw that potential and was willing to take the risk I feel like you know so and that's like the formula yeah got it thank you and this is for everyone given that each of you have broken down barriers can you tell us how you made that happen and what have what has been your biggest challenges 
what advice do you have for producers and writers watching this? Mm. Um, sorry, the first part of the question is why, why or how? Sorry, I just want to make sure I answer this appropriately. Sure thing. Um, how did you make it happen? How? Despite your challenges. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I can be honest, I feel like I'm still trying to make it happen. So there's that. Um, and it is a fight that will just continue on, right? Um, I, I liken the reason why um, I'm so passionate and a lot of the work I do is around barriers and, and pipeline entries um, is, you know, I think of how Issa and I, like our career started, like kind of in the digital space and in a place that where there were unwritten roles and you can kind of, you know, hire who you wanted to hire and, and create the content you wanted to see. And there was absolutely no barriers to um, excuse me, to being able to, to create those stories. So with that in mind, it's just inherently who we are. And we've taken that with us as we've crossed over into the industry and refused to take no for an answer because we've seen it, we've done it, right? And so this idea that the Hollywood is a different level and obviously at a much higher budget and much different crew, um, it's just, it's just something that we won't stand for because we just believe that it's just inherently wrong. And it is more than time historically in this industry to change the way we do things. And, um, and I'm just happy that it feels like it's finally caught up a little bit uh, because we've been preaching these things for probably, you know, I've been with Lisa now eight years working with her. So like, it's been that long since we've been um, trying to demand these kind of changes. So um, that's where I personally come from. In a similar way, I um, I started in the theater, and I um, the first thing I did was start a theater company because I kept asking, well, why do I, like all the because I started as an actor, and um, all the roles I was um, being you know going up for were like just Mr. Johnson like roles like 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 maid roles or you know, um, and so we I formed a company and just kept asking why of like of the of that industry, and then I feel like I'm doing that here too it's a similar thing it's just like you build it you come and you ask why but why, why is it this way why why are these structures uh this way so i feel like um just keep questioning and uh, uh, uh wh why it's being done and for so long why it's been done that way um if it, it, it feels like like that's like a, a powerful thing to to keep doing especially in this moment and i think for me you know and just in terms of my experience self-care is hugely important um, my own network of, you know, just a safe space. Uh, my, as Tanya and, and Denise talked about creating community, I think that's really important for all of us because it's not easy to be, to be a part of a different way of approaching things. It's not easy to visually look different when you sit at the room, you know, at the table and everybody else looks the same. Like none of these things are, are easy. And, um, you know, you kind of, you have to have tough skin and you have to believe in something and you have to have a North Star that you can always kind of refer back to. And um, for me personally, I wouldn't be here if I didn't have safe spaces to retreat to, you know, when I need to. Understandable, thank you. Um, why aren't more producers encouraging writers to go to editing, spotting, scoring, and other areas of post so that they can become a show a showrunner and get the experience they need? Um, you know, I think that, uh, it's like, why aren't producers? I mean, look, it, it should be inherently a thing that we do. Like we said, when we're talking about supporting and pipelines, it's like, we know that part of, um, being a showrunner is understanding the process. And so I do think, um, there is no reason why you can't, uh, put things in place on a show that you are in control of and a show that you are a producer on and encourage and yet empower, um, in collaboration with the showrunner of that show of how to be bringing in writers, um, who may not have written that episode who may not be at the producer level, but exposing them to the process. Right. And I think it's so important. And I know on a show like Insecure, like we are, we totally have an open door policy and we both encourage our writers and let them ask us, um, if there's a particular episode or something that they want to be a part of um, you know I've been in the scout band with not just the producer writers but like our staff writers who are coming along for the day scouting with us and seeing what happens there they are you know um, joining the, some of the production meetings just to, to see what that's like they are going into the edit with Prentice and Issa and just to see what is done there right and so it's it's having that um, a policy that is in place that allows um, the, uh, your writers to feel like there is a community here and that is supportive and that is encouraging and empowering and hopefully 
from that experience, you can also speak to that when they are up for those jobs at a certain level um, and trying to show that they have seen the process. Because again, catch 22, unless you've done it, someone's going to tell you you don't have the experience. And so to be able to value um, their, I don't call it a shadow experience, but in, in, to be able to value their exposure, um, you should also be willing to speak up for them as well so they can get those jobs and, and do it um, in that way. What's happened for me is that they've moved on to other jobs after like so you know they have the process of production in in that uh, in that process after i lost them as writers they move on to other jobs so like it, it um a lot of the times they're not uh available to that because they're working on something else that's that's how it's been but i always invite i want the you know writer of the that episode to to learn like because what denise is saying to empower and like um and to expose you know but but because of how we we work, you know, as writers now, like just move on, like you're nomadic, like you keep going from show to show. Okay, thank you. How would you approach pitching a series that has a concept centered around a BIPOC group um, that you, a person of color, are not culturally part of, but you understand and believe that there is space for the story and storytelling? Mm. A BIPOC, a non-BIPOC person pitching a BIPOC show? Yes. He really believes in the show. <laughs> yeah, look, I, I'm all for being passionate about wanting to tell other stories. However, um, you kind of have to check your own bias before you get into a room to pitch a show by not assembling a team that helps you reflect the show at the end of the day, right? Like it's, you, you, you again, not to say that you cannot develop, produce, or, or support other storytelling, but you should not be in the room pitching that without knowing that you've created a team around the project that helps you, um, that, that gives you the other awareness because that's when we talk about biases, like that is a bias, right? It's like you are assuming that you are the best person to come in and help sell the show idea to someone, however, you do not relate nor connect to it. So, um, you know, we all have that responsibility, whether you bring in another producing partner, whether you bring in a director, whether you attach a showrunner, whether you attach a writer, like you cannot say that there was no reason that you did not bring a team together that was inclusive to help represent this story before you got in the room. No stories about us without us, somehow. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> right. Like, so, at some, uh, like you said, like a, a producer level, the, you know, co-writer, whatever it is, but like to have that, to have that, um, arrogance that you can think that you think you can um represent that because you're connected to it it's it's not, it, you know um i i don't think we're in that moment anymore yeah. sorry but I, don't. I i just want to add i see the follow-up that she said um i i am black but i'm interested in pitching a show about an indigenous person i i would again just still yeah. encourage you to go find someone who uh, is indigenous, who can help partner with you on the show. Um, I don't know if you are a producer, if you're a writer producer or what role you're, you are playing in part of the show. But again, I think you have a responsibility if you are not that, that same, um, of that same culture to go and, and bring in a team that will help you, um, you know, do your own checks and balances and, and to help sell the series. Yeah. And in this, in that dynamic in particular, I think it's having a deep understanding that that indigenous people are arguably the least represented people in media. Um, and so there's a, a great responsibility there and understanding that and taking that on, however however that is, and it's more than just reading books, um, go to a reservation. Like how, how, if it, how can someone, how can we tell that story without having any experiences, without having anything to speak to? So. I think in that case, um, you know, roll up your sleeves and get out there. Did you read the WJ Natives Writer letter that just came out two days ago? That's a really oh. good list of demands to read. Uh, it just came out two days ago uh, on, on Indigenous Peoples Day. All right, great answers, thank you. This is for Tanya. How do you recommend presenting a queer story to a group of executives or producers who don't identify as such? Um, uh, as truthfully as you can, especially if, if, if you yourself are queer, um, you have a bit of authority um, uh, uh, on it. Um, but yeah, uh, I mean, that's, I mostly have presented uh, our stories to non-queers and um, you just as truthfully as you, as you can. 
uh, and respectfully. Don't, you don't need to be didactic and teach anything. Um, I just got pitched something where I was like, I just got taught about identity and it's, it's okay to like include it in, in the story and the characters, but not, don't make a lesson out of it, you know? Great, thank you. Not only are you diverse ethnically, but you are all women. Can you talk about that for a minute? How does being a woman add to the challenges you face and also to your outlooks, your outlook on the issues of equity, on issues like equity or something uh, in that, that nature? <laughs> it's like, who wants to go first? This uh, is a tough one. You yeah, know, it is. Um, it's a, it's a really tough one. I think as I'll just speak for myself as a woman of color, sometimes I feel abandoned by my male color counter, like counterparts. Um, sometimes I feel abandoned by my white women counterparts. So it's a, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a tough thing to navigate. Um, but this is my life. This is the life I was born into. This is the, the life I chose for myself to some degree. And, in, in, um, so here I am, you know, I, I show up every day and I do the best that I can. Yeah, uh, I, w I was gonna say um, something very, that's tangential, but it's, you know, look, I, I don't have, I am who I am, like, like Lena says, right? I am a queer black woman and I realize and recognize from a very early, early on start of the industry that quite honestly, in, in most cases, I will might be the only one in the room and that's, not okay, but I am okay with that as long as I know I'm doing my part to make sure that changes, right? And, and I think I'm very um, aware of the issues that our industry faces, but I also don't wear a chip on my shoulder. And I, I refuse to you know, make that something that holds me back from my own career. And, and a, a way to think about it is knowing that once I'm in the room and I am the only one and I don't have the support, um, I deserve to be there. And I think so often people can get in their own way, um, allowing the disadvantages we face as women of color to hold them back in some capacity. And I think it should encourage you and empower you to speak up to um, you know, to make people aware that you are uncomfortable and you don't want to only continue to be the only person. And quite honestly, on top of that, what are you going to do about it? And I think as long as um, you kind of have that perspective, you know, um, it doesn't make it okay and it doesn't make it more comfortable, but I just personally learned to, I just always had to learn to live with it, but I think um, it's what fuels the, the work that I do and why I'm so passionate about um, playing my part because I, I'm fed up. And I hope that when I'm old and gray and, and, and retiring out that like, I, have, I am no longer the only person. That's, that's how I see it. I mean, I, I agree, I, I hope as well. Um, and our final question, and uh, just quickly in the last moments we have, what final advice do you have for producers and writers watching this? I almost just want to give a recap of everything we said. Um, I don't know. The, the the first thing that came to mind is is um, like I said, be be aware, make sure you're doing your part at the end of the day, and um, and and try to if you if you aren't a part of any organizations, groups, collective conversations, like. Um, I think it's great today that you joined us, but also there are so many other things that you can also be taking part in to, you know, again, help create a uh, real systemic change in whatever way that looks like. And so I would encourage you to have the same dialogues with um, your friends and the people that are around you and the people you work with, but also, you know, check about uh, check in with yourself about what you are doing outside of just listening and how you can play a more active role. That would be my biggest advice. I think we're in a moment um, where we can be bold and shame a little bit to 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 sort of make this correction. I I, I you know I, I I believe in it and um um I encourage us to like speak our minds in a way that maybe we would not like, we were taught to like you know um um not do as much but like um shaming works meaning calling out injustices is what I'm saying you know being bold about it um it, it whether it's in um in a conference room or, you know, kind of how I'm getting, you know, it on Twitter. And it, it's, I think it's, it's the moment. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I feel like the, a lot of our conversation was kind of in this, 
sort of space already. So I think we're all kind of struggling, trying not to retread on things that we've already said. Um, but, you know, we have a responsibility in terms of the programming that we create. You know, Tanya is talking about her experience being in London and, you know, feeling an, an absence of representation in Hollywood media affecting her experience in London and then also feeling this greater weight of responsibility because she's representing every day. Um, and in many ways, creating a model that people are going to be thinking about after she's gone. So I think understanding that, yes, Hollywood, we are creating content that is being consumed around the world. And what are we saying? What are we doing with that power? Um, and, you know, some of us may be coming into what our, our careers for the sake of entertaining and making money. And that's great too. Um, but still, I don't think everyone needs to be approaching the work in a way of social justice. Um, I don't think anyone's asking that. I think it's okay that there's programming that's just funny or, or feel good or whatever the case may be. But I think still understanding that even in those instances that we have to be accountable for the content that we are creating and what effects good and bad may come from that. Okay, thank you. Once again, I want to thank our panelists, Rena Brannon, Denise Davis, and Tanya Siracho. I also want to give a special thanks to John Corser, Linda Evans, Stephanie Dawson, Julie Goldstein, and of course, the PGA. If you'd like to continue the conversation with me, Anissa, in the Internalized Racism and Bias group, or as an attendee or co-chair, please be sure to reach out to me on Slack or via email. Speaking of email, keep an eye out on your email for the takeaways. The next session is Diversity and Casting, and it will be on November 19th at 9 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Central, 12 p.m. Eastern. Mark your calendars now and look for the invite in the PGA newsletter. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.